talk is called end-to-end -end formal um, ISA verification uh, of RISC-V processors with RISC-V formal. I have no idea what this means, but I'm very excited to understand what it means. And uh, Clifford promised he's going to make sure that everyone will. Um, Clifford has been very known in the open source and free uh, software, free source, uh, oh my gosh, free and open source um, community, and especially he's known for the project Ice Storm. Um, please help me welcome Clifford. Thank you. Um, so my talk is about end-to-end formal ISA verification of this five processors with this five formal. And I thought maybe I'd start with breaking down this risk five bit. Um, so what's risk five? Uh, RISC-V is an open instruction set architecture, it's an open ISA. So it's not a processor, but it's a processor specification, an ISA specification that is free to use for everyone. Um, and if you happen to have already implemented your own processor at one point in time, you might know that it's actually much easier to implement a processor than to implement all the tools that you need to compile programs for your processor. And if you use something like RISC-V, then you can reuse the tools that are already out there. So that's a great benefit. However, uh, for this endeavor, we need processors that are actually really compatible to each other, processors that implement the RISC-V ISA correctly. So with many other ISAs, we start with one processor and we say, oh, that's the processor. And later on, we figure out there was a bug. And what people sometimes do is they just change the specification so that the specification now fits the hardware they actually have. We can't do something like that with RISC-V, where there are many, many implementations out there all being developed in parallel to fit the same specification. So we want to have some kind of means to make sure that all these processors actually agree about what the um, ISA specification is. So what's um, formal verification? Formal verification is a super broad term. Um, in the context of this talk, I'm talking about hardware model checking. More specifically, I'm talking about um, checking of so-called safety properties. So we have some hardware design and we have an initial state and we would like to know if this hardware design can reach a bad state from the initial state. That's um, formally the problem that we are um, uh, trying to solve here. Um, and there are two, two means to do that, two different categories of proofs. There are bounded and unbounded proofs. And with the bounded proofs, we only prove that it's impossible to reach a bad state within a certain number of cycles. So we give a maximum bound for the length of a counterexample. And with unbounded proofs, we prove that a bad state can actually never be reached. So um, unbounded proofs are, of course, better if you can make an unbounded proof. Um, but in many cases, this is very hard to achieve. Um, but bounded proofs is something that we can do. Um, so I'm talking about bounded proofs here um, for the most part. So what's end-to-end -end formal verification? Uh, because that's also in my title. Uh, so historically, when you formally verify something like a processor, um, you break down the processor in many small components, and then you write properties for each component and prove for each component individually that they uh, adhere to the properties. And then you make a more abstract proof that if you put a system together from components that have this property, then this system will have the properties that you want. Uh, with end-to-end -end verification, uh, we treat the processor as one huge black box and just ask the question, does this one huge thing fit our specification, have the properties that we want? Um, that has a couple of advantages. Um, it's much, much easier this way to take one specification and port it from one processor to another because we don't care about how the processor is built internally. Um, and it's much easier to take the specification that we have and actually match it to other specifications of the ISA because we have a specification that says what is the overall behavior we accept, expect from our processor. 
But the big disadvantage, of course, is that it's computationally much more expensive to do end-to-end -end, uh, formal verifications. Um, and doing this end-to-end -end verification of a processor against an ISA specification is something that historically was always viewed as like the textbook example of things that you can't do with formal methods. But fortunately, the solvers, they became much better in the last couple of years. And now if we use the right tricks, we can do stuff like that uh, with uh, no the solvers we have nowadays. So that's RISC V Formal. RISC V Formal is a framework that allows us to do end to end formal verification of RISC V processors against a formal version of the ISA specification. So RISC V Formal is not a formally verified processor. Instead, if you happen to have a RISC V processor, you can use RISC V Formal to prove that your processor conforms to the ISA specification. Um, for the most part, uh, this is using uh, bounded methods. Theoretically, you could do unbounded proofs with RISC-V formals, but it's not the, the main use case. Um, so it's good for what we call bug hunting, because maybe there is a counterexample that would show that the processor could diverge from the desired behavior with 1,000 or 5,000 cycles. But usually, when you have something like a processor and uh, you can't reach a bad state within a very short bound, um, you have high confidence that actually your processor implements the ISA correctly. Um, so if you have a processor and you would like to integrate it with RISC-V formal, um, you need to do two things. You need to add a special trace port to your processor. It's called the RVFI trace port, RISC-V formal interface trace port. Um, and you have to configure RISC-V formal so that RISC-V formal understands the, um, the, the attributes of your processor. So for example, RISC-V uh, is available in a 32-bit and a 64-bit uh, version. You have to tell RISC-V formal if you want to verify a 32-bit or a 64-bit processor. Um, RISC-V is a modular ISA, so there are a couple of extensions, and you have to tell RISC-V formal which extensions your processor actually um, implements. Um, and then there are a couple of other things that are uh, transparent for a userland process. Um, uh, like if uh, unaligned loads or stores are supported by the hardware natively. Because RISC-V, the spec, only says uh, that when you do an unaligned load or store, then a user space program can expect this load or store to succeed, but it might take a long time because there might be a machine interrupt handler that is emulating an unaligned load store by doing aligned loads and stores. Um, but if we do this formal verification of the processor, then the uh, RISC-V formal framework must be aware what is the expected behavior for your core. Should it trap when it sees an unaligned load store or should it uh, just perform the load store unaligned? So what does this interface look like that you need to implement in your processor if you would like to use RISC-V formal? Um, this is the current version of the RISC-V formal interface. Um, right now, there is no support for floating point instructions, um, and there is no support for CSRs. But this is on the to-do list, uh, so this interface will grow larger and larger when we add these additional features. But all these additional features will be optional. Uh, and one of the reasons is that some might implement just small microcontrollers that actually don't have floating point cores or that don't have uh, support for the uh, privileged um, uh, specifications so they don't have CSRs. Um, through this interface, whenever the core retires an instruction, it documents which instruction it retired. So it tells us, this is the instruction word I retired, this was the program counter, where I found the instruction. This is the program counter for the next instruction. These are the registers that I read, and these are the values that I've observed in the register file. This is the register that I've written, and this is the value that I have written to the register file, all that stuff. So in short, what we document through the RISC-V formal interface is uh, the part of the processor state that is observed by an instruction and the change to the state of the processor that is performed by an instruction, like changes to the register file or changes to the program counter. Uh, and of course, um, um, most processors actually are superscalar. 
even those processors that say they're non-super scalar in-order pipelines usually can do stuff like like retire memory load instructions out of order and parallel to another instruction uh, that does not write the register, things like that. Um, so even with, uh, with processors we usually don't think of as uh, super scalar processors, even with those processors we need uh, the capability to retire more than one instruction each cycle. Um, and this can be done with this n red parameter, and we see all the ports um, are like five times wider if n red is uh, is five. Okay, so when we have a processor that implements this interface, uh, what is the verification strategy that Risk Five uh, formal uh, follows in order to do this proof to formally verify that our processor is actually correct? So there is not one big proof that we run. Instead, there is a large number of very small proofs uh, that we run. Uh, this is like the most important trick uh, when, when it comes to this. And there are two categories of proofs. Uh, one uh, category is what I call the instruction checks. Uh, we have one of those proofs for each instruction in the ISA specification and each of the channels in the RISC-V formal interface. Um, so this is easily a couple of hundred proofs right there uh, because you easily have 100 instructions and if you have like two channels, you always have 200 proofs that you have to run. Um, and what these instruction checks do, they uh, reset the processor uh, or the start at a symbolic state if you would like to run um, a, a unbounded proof. Um, let the process run for a certain number of cycles and then it assumes that in the last cycle um, the uh, processor will retire a certain instruction. So if this check checks if the add instruction works correctly, it assumes that the last instruction retired and the last cycle of this bounded check uh, will be an add instruction. And then it looks all and then it looks at all the interfaces on the RISC-V formal interface um, to make sure that this is compliant with an add instruction. It checks if the instruction has been decoded correctly. It uh, checks if the register value we write to the register file is actually the sum of the values we read from the register file, um, all that kind of stuff. Um, but of course, if you just have this instruction checks, there is still a certain verification gap. Uh, because the core might lie to us. The core might say, oh, I write this value to the register file, but then not write the value to the register file. So we have to have a separate set of proofs that do not look at the entire RISC-V formal interface in one cycle, but look at only a small fraction of the RISC-V formal interface, but over a span of cycles. So for example, there is one check that says, if I write the register and then later I read the register, I better read back the value that I have written to the register file. Um, and uh, this I call consistency checks. Um, yeah, so that's, uh, I think, what I said already. Um, so for each instruction uh, with RISC-V formal, we have a uh, um, instruction model that uh, looks like that. So these are two slides. The first slide is just the uh, uh, interface. Um, where we have a couple of signals from this RISC-V formal um, interface that we read, like uh, the instruction uh, um, that we are executing, the program counter where we found this instruction, the register values we read. Um, and then we have a couple of, uh, of, of signals that are generated by our specification, that are output of this uh, specification model, like which register um, which registers should we read? Which register should we write? What value should we write to that register? Stuff like that. Um, so that's the interface. It's the same for all the instructions. Um, and then we have a body that looks more like, like that for all the instructions that just decodes the instruction, checks if this is actually the instruction the check is for. So in this case, it's an add immediate instruction. Um, and then we have things like uh, the line near the bottom about above default assignments, assigns back PC write data, for example, says, okay, the next PC must be five, uh, four bytes uh, later than the PC for this instruction. Uh, we must increment the program counter by a value of four when we execute this instruction. Uh, things like that. Yeah, um, so you might see there is no assert here. There are no assertions because this is just the model of what kind of behavior we would expect. And then there is a wrapper that instantiates this and instantiates the core and builds the proof. And there are the assertions. Um, 
The main reason why we don't have assertions here, but instead we output the desired behavior here, is because I can also generate monitor cores that can run alongside your core and check in simulation or in emulation and FPGA if your core is doing the right thing. Uh, that can be very, very helpful if you have uh, a situation where you run uh, your core for maybe days and then you have some, some observable behavior that's not right. But maybe there are thousands, or even million cycles between the point where you can observe that something is wrong and the point where the process actually started diverging from what the specification uh, said. And if you can uh, use a monitor core like that, then it's much easier to find bugs like this. Um, okay, so some examples of those consistency checks. The list is actually not complete. Um, and it uh, varies a little bit from processor to processor, what kind of consistency checks we can actually run uh, with the processor we're looking at. Um, there is a uh, check if the program counter for one instruction. So I have an instruction that says, this is the program counter for the instruction, and this is the program counter for the next instruction. And then we can look at the next instruction, and we can see, is uh, the program counter for that instruction, actually the, pro the next program counter value for the previous instruction. And they must link together like that. Um, but the core might uh, um, retire instructions out of order. So it might be that we see the first instruction first and then the second instruction later, but it's also possible that we see the second instruction first and then the first instruction uh, later. And because of that, there are two different uh, checks, one for a pair in the non-reversed order and for a pair of instruction in the reversed order. Uh, there is one check that checks if uh, register value reads and writes are consistent. Um, there is one check that sees uh, if the processor is alive, so when I uh, I give the processor certain fairness uh, uh, constraints that uh, uh, the memory will always return uh, a memory read within a certain number of cycles, things like that, then I can use this to prove that the process will not just suddenly freeze. This is very important. Uh, and this will also prove that the processor is not skipping instruction indices, which is very important because some of the other uh, checks actually depend on the processor behaving in this way. Um, and, and so forth. So there are a couple of these consistency checks, and it's a nice exercise to, to sit down in a group of people and go through the list of, uh, of consistency checks and see which, which set of them actually is meaningful or which set of them actually leaves an, an interesting uh, verification gap, and we still need to, to add checks for this or that process to them. OK, so what kind of bugs can it find? Um, that's a super hard question, because uh, um, um, it's really hard to give a complete list. Um, it can definitely find incorrect single-threaded uh, instruction semantics. So if you just implement a instruction incorrectly in your core, then, then this will find it. Um, no question about it. Uh, it can find a lot of bugs in things like bypassing and forwarding and pipeline interlocks, things like that. Um, things where, where you reorder stuff in a way you shouldn't reorder them. Um, uh, freezes, if you have this liveness check. Um, some bugs related to memory interfaces and load store uh, consistency and things like that. Uh, but that depends on the on things like the size of your cache lines, uh, if this is a feasible proof or not. Uh, bugs that we can't find yet with RISC-V formal um, are things that are not yet covered with the RISC-V formal interface, uh, like the floating point stuff or CSRs. But this is all on the to-do list, so we are actively working on that. and. A year from now, this, this stuff will be included. Um, and anything related to concurrency between multiple hearts. Um, uh, so far, my excuse for that was that the RISC-V memory model is not completely specified yet. Uh, so I would not actually know what, what to check exactly. But right now, the RISC-V memory model is in the process of being finalized. So I won't have this excuse for much, much longer. So the processors currently supported are uh, Pico RV32, which is my own processor, uh, then RISC-V Rocket, which is probably like the most famous RISC-V implementation, and VEX RISC-V. Um, and there are also a couple of others, but they are not part of the uh, like open source release of, of RISC-V uh, formal. So if you would like to add support for RISC uh, to RISC-V formal for your RISC-V processor, then just uh, check out the RISC-V Formal repository, look at the course directory. 
see which of the supported cores is like most closely to the core that you actually have, and then just copy that directory and make a couple of small modifications. Um, so I have a few minutes left uh, to talk about uh, things like cut points and black boxes and other abstractions. Um, so the title of this slide could just be abstractions, because cut points and black boxes are just abstractions. The idea behind an abstraction in formal methods is that I switch out part of my design with a different part, with a different circuit that is uh, um, less constrained. It includes the behavior of the original circuit, but might do other stuff as well. So the textbook example would be I have a design with a counter. And uh, usually the counter would just increment in steps of one. But now I create an abstraction that can skip numbers and will just uh, increment uh, in, uh, in strictly increasing steps. Um, and this, of course, includes the behavior of the original design. So if I can prove a property with this abstraction in place instead of the just increment by one counter, then we have proven even a stronger property. And that includes the same property for the thing with the, uh, in the original design. Um, and actually, this idea of abstractions works very well with RISC-V formal. So the main reason why we do abstractions is because it leads uh, uh, to, to easier proofs. Um, so for example, consider an instruction checker that just checks if the core implements the add instruction correctly. Um, this, for this checker, we don't actually need a register file that's working. We could replace the register file by something that just ignores all rights to it. Um, and whenever we read something from the register file, it returns an arbitrary value. That would still include the behavior of a core with a functional register file, but because the instruction checker does not care about consistency between register file writes and register file reads, um, we can still prove that the instruction is implemented correctly, um, and therefore we get an easier proof. Of course, we can't use this abstraction for all those proofs, because there are other proofs that actually check if my register file works as I would expect it to work. Um, but if we go through the list of proofs and we run all these proofs independently, then you will see that for each of them, it's possible to abstract away a large portion of your processor and therefore uh, yield an, an, an easier proof. Um, depending on what kind of solvers you use, some solvers are actually very capable of finding this kind of abstractions themselves. So in that case, it doesn't really help uh, by adding these abstractions manually. But just realizing that the potential for these abstractions is there is something that's, that's very useful when, when guiding uh, your decisions how to split up a large verification problem into smaller verification problems, because you would like to split up the problem in a way so that the solver is only always capable of, of finding useful abstractions that actually lead to easier circuits to prove. Um, yeah, with a bounded check, we also have uh, the uh, questions of what bounds do we use. Of course, larger bounds are better, but larger bounds also uh, yield something that is harder to compute. Um, and uh, if you have a small bound, well, then you have a, a proof that runs very, very quickly, but maybe you're not very confident that it actually has proven something that's relevant for you. So I propose two solutions for this. Uh, the first solution is you can use the same solvers uh, to find traces that cover certain events. And you could write a list and say, uh, I would like to see one memory read and one memory write and at least one ALU instruction executed and things like that. And then you can ask the solver, what is the shortest trace that would actually satisfy um, all this stuff? Um, and when that's a trace of, say, 25 cycles, then you know, OK, when I look at a, at, at a proof that's 25 cycles deep, I know at least these are the cases that are going to be covered. But uh, more important, I think, is uh, usually when you have a processor, you already found bugs. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's a good idea to, to not just fix the bugs and forget about them, but preserve some way of, of reintroducing the bugs just to see if your testing framework works. So if you, if you have already a couple of bugs and you know, oh, it took me a week to find that and took me a month to find that, the best thing is to just uh, add the bugs to your design again and see what are the bounds that are necessary for RISC-V formal to actually discover those bugs. And then you will have some degree of confidence that other similar bugs would also have been found with the same uh, bounds. 
So results, I have found uh, bugs in pretty much every implementation I looked at. I found uh, bugs in all three processors. We found bugs in Spike, which is the official implementation of RISC-V in C. And I found a way to ver formally verify my specification against Spike. And in some cases, where I found a difference between my uh, specification and Spike, it turned out it was actually a bug in the English language specification. Um, so because of that, I also found bugs in the English language specification with RISC-V formal. Um, future work. Um, uh, multiply is already supported. The floating point is still on the to-do list. 64-bit uh, is like half done. Um, we would like to add support for CSRs. Um, um, we would like to add support for more cores, but this is something that I would like to do slowly because adding more cores also means we have less flexibility with, with changing things um, and better integration with non-free tools because um, um, right now all of that runs with open source tools that I also happen to write. Uh, so I wrote those tools. Um, but some people actually don't want to my, use my open source tools. They would like to use the commercial tools. And it's on the to-do list that I have better integration with those tools. Uh, maybe because I don't get licenses to those tools. So we will see how this works. Um, yeah, that's it. Uh, do we have still time for questions? <laughs> <laughs> so I'd say okay. we start with questions at one. <laughs> um, sorry, okay. here we go. Um, we have two questions. We have time for two questions. And we're going to start with microphone number one, please. Uh, hello. Thanks for your talk and for your work. Uh, first question, uh, you told about uh, RISC-V formal interface. Yes. Uh, so uh, does vendor um, ship the final processor with this inter interface available? Oh, uh, yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, this interface has only output ports. Uh, and actually, when you implement this interface, you should not add something to your design that's not needed to generate those output ports. So what you can do is you can take the version of your core with that interface, the version of the core without that interface, then in your synthesis script, just remove those output ports and then run a formal equivalence check between that version and the version that you actually deploy on your ASIC. Thanks. And uh, one short question. Uh, when people say form formal verification, usually others think, oh, if it is verified, it is excellent. So uh, absolutely excellent. And uh, do you plan to say that it will find all the errata for the processor. Well, it, it depends on what kind of proof you run. The most work I do is with bounded proofs. Um, and there you only get a certain degree of confidence uh, because you only see bugs that can occur within a certain number of cycles from reset. But uh, if you want, you can also run a complete proof um, where you start with a symbolic state instead of a reset state. And then you can, uh, can make sure that you actually check the entire reachable state space. But that's a very, very hard thing to do. So that's not, not a weekend project. Just adding the RISC-V formal interface and running some bounded proofs is probably a weekend check, uh, project if you already have uh, your RISC-V processor. Thank you. Thank you. We actually do not have time for any more questions. Um, but there will be time after the talk to ask you questions, maybe? Yeah, uh, so maybe you can find me at the Open FPGA assembly, which is part of the hardware hacking area. Super. Very great job to put that much information into 30 minutes. Please help me thank Cliff for his wonderful talk. <laughs>